Uh, I just kind of want to wrap up a few things that will be relevant, especially for the final and maybe helpful. Um, I'm just kind of moving forward with some stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. Where are we at? Here. All right. Awesome. So what I want to do is talk about um, a few things. I want to talk a little bit about, I, I want to kind of just skim through network models real quick and spend a little bit more time with integer programming as opposed to uh, anything else. And then we'll talk about um, the Monte Carlo stuff from there. So network models are really just a, it is essentially an extension of some of the stuff that we've talked about before with, linear, with our other linear programming problems. Um, but the goal for these is to usually minimize something related to the cost of travel, whether it's miles driven, whether it's fuel consumption, whatever it might be, it's some kind of cost minimization problem, right? And so how you define cost is kind of going to be up to you. But the goal is to transverse a certain, uh, a certain set of, of nodes, essentially. So these are called nodes get into these network problems. So here the, the kind of node that we see set up is going to be for travel from LA to Boston. So if we have these various waypoints that we are going to pass through and they all have some kind of directional flow to them. So you can see the arrows are directional. They're not bi-directional, uh, so they are directed. So the, the direction of the arrows direct the flow through the, the potential flow through the network. So we can see that we would go from LA to Omaha or LA to Topeka, so forth and so on. Again, each of these has, uh, each of these decisions at each of these nodes has some kind of cost associated with it. And if we want to minimize the cost, then it just turns into um, essentially a linear, uh, a, a, a type of linear programming problem where we would say we either go to that place or not. So it's kind of a, turns into a very specific form of nonlinear or of a, of a binary programming problem where we either turn a node on or not. So we're going to see a little bit more about these binary problems in, in just a little while, but essentially all we're ever doing is saying we either go to this place or not. So it's kind of a, the, the very high level overview of of a transportation network kind of problem. So there's some information here that we get into about the, the inflows and outflows and how things can go from one place to another. And we don't need to worry too much about this for now. It's something that we would, we would uh, get into at a, at a different time if we, if we wanted to. Um, so here's a kind of a, a classic example of a network problem, and this is a transportation problem. So this is just a very small example of what you would see um, in just about any other kinds of networking issue. So if you think about what things like UPS and FedEx and all kinds of other big logistic companies have to deal with, they deal with problems like this all of the time. What is a way that they would minimize the number of miles that they would drive, right? The number of stops they would have to make. So this kind of relates to this. But if we if we look at it and kind of break this problem into something like this, we have S1 or S2 and S3, right? So these are our source nodes. We also have D1 through D4. So these each of these nodes, right, is related to whether it's the source or the destination. So you can see that each source goes to a destination. Not only does it go to a destination, but it has a certain cost associated with going to each destination. So if I look at source one, I can see that it costs, uh, whatever its unit cost is to go to destination one is 35. Destination two is 30, destination three is 40, and destination four is 32. So I see the cost associated with each of these things. So the next thing that kind of comes into play here, and this, so this is our, this is, this is going to turn into our minimization problem, is that we want to minimize the cost of something. But what we now set up is a series of constraints that dictate what um, each of these 
things will will essentially require. So let's start with this first constraint here, this x11 through x14, and they have to be less than or equal to 1200. So what that essentially means is that our x11, x12, right, if we're labeling these as, as points along here, that it cannot uh, exceed 1,200. So it's essentially uh, turns into a um, uh, into a, a resource constraint. What we're saying here is that source one only has up to 1,200 units to give. It cannot exceed that. So this is these are all source constraints, right? So we see that there's three constraints here that take these forms for the sources. So source two, for instance only can give up 1,000 things, right? So it's got 1,000 to give, and source three has 800 to give. So these are the, these are the constraints that are, that are guiding this, the sources. They cannot exceed these, uh, this, this number of, of resources. On the other hand, though, we see that each of our four destinations have a need constraint-wise that they have to get at least this much resource from any of the three, a combination of the three, um, the three initial sources. So we can see that here is, is our X1, right? That's destination one, essentially. So it has to receive at least 1,100 units from all of the three sources combined. It doesn't matter which one it comes from or which combination of them it comes from. It just needs to ex have at least 1,100 units arriving to destination one. So we can see that all of those are, are oh, we can see the rest of them, whether it's uh, destination two, destination three, and destination four. That's the way this problem sets up. Right, we have to solve this series of constraints. And since this is just a really kind of straightforward problem at this point, um, this would be a pretty, uh, a pretty easy problem uh, to throw into a linear programming kind of problem, right? It's, it's already set up the way we would want it, the way we've seen all of our other programming problems uh, kind of set up and ready uh, to roll through. So nothing too much would need to be done here to make this solvable. Uh, but that's kind of, a, again, a classic problem. Uh, here, again, here's some other visualization stuff and for networking problems, and that's all, fun. Uh, that's all great, again. Um, we're not going to see any of that on the final. So I just, like I said, I kind of wanted to, to go through it just so you get an idea of what it is and, and, and how it sets up. Something that's a little bit more, um, that will be a little bit more relevant for the, um, for the final is on the integer programming side. So when we're talking about these integer programmings, we've seen stuff that kind of looks like it already. So if we go all the way back to where we saw that advertising example, right? Um, in that advertising example, we were trying to figure out what ad strategy was going to cost the least amount of money while still getting all of our, um, uh, all of our, our, all of our necessary exposures. So with that, uh, we saw that we had some ad recommendations that gave us uh, decimal values. I think it was something like 7.5 for a specific show. So if we wanted to make that to where we would only allow this program to solve it, uh, allowing integers only, this is where integer programming becomes important. So anything that doesn't have a, um, the ability to, to take on a proportional value, that's where we would want to turn to integer programming. So if you think about, if you go to any given store, right, there would be some things that you can buy a half of. You could buy a half a pound of something, but nobody is going to let you walk out with a half a can of beans, for instance, right? You're, you have to buy the whole can. So if you wanted to know how many cans of beans you needed to buy, it's probably going to turn into an integer programming problem. And this is where we can kind of break these integer programming problems down a little bit more. So we see we go from uh, just a, a pure integer programming problem where everything can take integers to a mixed integer programming problem, which is obviously, or you know, kind of obviously a combination of lots of different things uh, where they can be integers, they can be binary, or they could be uh, proportional values. And then we also have zero one programming or binary problems. So when we get into these zero one problems, we're either selecting something or not, or choosing to take something with us or not. And we'll see another. Uh, we'll see an example of a binary constraint in just uh, in just a, a minute. So um, the one thing that's kind of 
if not super important, but kind of interesting to note here, is when we are talking about linear programming problems, they're always um, expressed with how complex they are to solve and how long it is they take to solve. So ideally, the number of terms that you have, um, as you add more terms into the model, it doesn't become harder to solve. But when we get into um, things like these integer programming problems um, and binary problems, and they, we would see later on, we would see um, some nonlinear problems, they start to become really difficult to solve uh, computationally. Um, the more things we stack into there, really the, the more complex they become. And one thing that we would maybe tend to see uh, with these kinds of problems is that there is not always a guaranteed one single best solution. Um, whereas when we were dealing in those linear programming problems before, uh, we always kind of had an, a single optimal solution. When we're dealing in problems like this, we can't always guarantee the one single optimal solution. Sometimes there could be uh, alternative solutions that may be just as good. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're getting a bad solution. It just means there's no guarantee of one single optimal solution. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind here. So uh, I'll give you a, kind of this classic example here. Um, and again, this point here, right? This knapsack problem is that it's NP complete. So it's, it's kind of an important thing, right? That no algorithm to solve this problem is always going to be fast and correct. Uh, there can be times where you kind of have to sacrifice what you end up having. But when we are dealing with this, this knapsack problem, and again, you can kind of see how this would work out in, uh, in a lot of various dimensions. Uh, what we have is a problem that sets up like this. So the sum of VI, XI. So for everything that we're going to pick, we're going to multiply it by something. And it's subject to some kind of constraint. In the knapsack problem, we are going to have that constraint BW, which is going to stand for weight. So we're going to impose some kind of weight restriction. So if you think about uh, anytime you have to fly, right, ideally you want your suitcase to be under some kind of weight limit, right? So when your suitcase under, has to be under some weight limit, it turns into a knapsack problem. What do you need to take? What's the utility function for taking that thing? And how much is it going to contribute to the total weight that you can actually have in that suitcase? So the knapsack problem turns into a really, it's been around for a long time, but it still continues to have applications in, in how, we, uh, how we think through these things. And then also for shipping, uh, again, the same kind of problems come into this. Um, but let's, let, me, let me throw this one more thing out here to you here that we haven't seen in any of our problems in the past, and that this xi has to be a zero or a one. So we're essentially turning this into a binary programming problem. If we think of all the items that we could potentially take with us, we're either going to take it or not. So that's the, those are the values that it's gonna take on. It's not taking on anything proportional, it's taking on a zero or a one, that's it. So let's, uh, let's see kind of how this problem would set up in solving it in R. So let's say that we're, we're going to use ROI how we have in the past. We're going to say that we have 10 variables. So that's giving us 10 objects to choose from. All right. So those 10 variables will be the 10 objects that we have to choose from. Uh, we're going to set a capital W as our weight, our weight max. So we're going to say that we cannot exceed 20 pounds here. This V is going to be a value, right? So what, what I mean by value here is uh, essentially the value to us and how important this thing would be uh, to take. So if we think about we are planning a trip to the beach, which I think we could probably all agree would be decent to do right now, um, there would be things that we would probably assign a pretty high value to. So things like flip-flops, bathing suits, right? Those are going to be high value. Something like snow boots, probably a pretty low value to have in our, in our knapsack, right? So by value here, we're talking about how important this thing would be to us to take with us. That's what value means. All right. So now we also want to have uh, uh, some weights assigned to this. And by weight, I mean physical weight, like how much do these things weigh? And here we're just assigning some random weights for how much each of our 10 items 
will weigh, right? So remember we have 10 items here and this is just how much each of them weigh. And you can see what the weights here shake out to be. Uh, so item one, for example, has a weight of 2.36 pounds, All right? So nothing too wild there. So let's uh, step through the rest of this, kind of how we have in the past, right? Here's our, our one primary constraint for this model is that our weights have to be less than the total weight, right? So each of those weights, the, the combination of them, we cannot exceed 20 pounds. Remember, pounds are what we set up um, as their, or 20 pounds is what we set up as the max that we can carry with us. So whatever we choose, we just cannot exceed 20 pounds. Right, <clears throat> so here's where things kind of get interesting. Our objective is going to be V. Those are what we're trying to maximize here. We are trying to maximize whether or not we take this stuff with us or not, and its value. So we want to maximize our value here. We want to be able to have the most important things that we that we really can. Um, so we're 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 maximizing the total value that we have. So we have our constraints, how we have before. We also have bounds, right? We're gonna specify some bounds. We've seen these bounds before. We're gonna set this to uh, whether it's, you know, for all of our items, we're going to specify a lower bound and an upper bound. The lower bound is going to be zero and the upper bound is going to be one. So that's just gonna be one way to lock this stuff in as, as being uh, zero through one. The other thing that's kind of new that we've not seen before is this types variable or this types argument. So here we are specifying that we are dealing only in a binary constraint situation. So that B there stands for binary. So not only are we saying that we're locked in between zero and one, but also that they will be binary. It is just a zero or a one. So here we have this set up to where we are going to maximize our total value of the things that we select while keeping it under 20 pounds in total and then also um, making these all binary. So when you look at the, our, our model here, this sets up pretty nicely. It gives us all the information that we need that we have 10 binary objective variables. Remember we have, we have 10 items to take. So that takes on 10 binary items, right? Item one, we take it or we don't. Item two, we take it or we don't. Three, so forth and so on. We are either taking these things or we're not. All right. So here, when we solve this, we see what our, our value is. So a few things that um, uh, just to point out to you here, there's not a lot of really interesting or cool information here. Uh, more like uh, one thing to kind of note here is, is just the number of iterations that this went through. I think the number of iterations that we have seen before are usually pretty low in what we've dealt with here. But here we've had to go up to 21 iterations to find some kind of optimal value here for our particular uh, problem. So when, when I earlier I mentioned that these problems are a little bit more complicated than what we have seen in the past, they're not always more complicated to program, it's just computationally they're more, they're more complicated. So one thing to, to make note of there. So this kind of works out uh, in a fun way here is that for what I have in my problem here, I am taking a bunch of stuff with me, which is great. There's only one thing that doesn't come along. Everything that has a one gets brought. So I'll, I'm bringing item one, I'm bringing item two. It's not until I get to, what is it? 10, nine, eight, seven, item seven, that I'm not going to bring item seven with me. So this solves the problem of maximizing my total value and choosing which things I'm going to take with me. So these binary problems, again, are, are useful for, for situations like this where you have to pick something to take with you based upon some kind of value. Um, but these are also useful th for things like scheduling. So uh, for anybody who before all this craziness happened, maybe had a job somewhere, had an on-campus job or something like that, or was responsible for figuring out the scheduling for something, these binary programming problems will handle these, uh, those scheduling issues um, very well. So if you need to have a certain number of people during a certain time frame, and you either turn that schedule on or off for an individual person, these binary problems uh, or these binary techniques would go a long way to helping to do that. So 
I do want to show you really quickly um, this OMPR package. It does the exact same thing that um, that ROI just did or any other thing would have done for us. But this syntax is a little bit different. The syntax is a um, uh, it's kind of weird to get used to, but it works very much in the same way that some of the big dedicated uh, linear programming and programming uh, in general on optimization programs work. Some of the, the big standalone programs that are out there. Um, again, I'm not going to worry about going all the way through this because it's uh, something you won't really have to have to use. It's there for now just for completeness. But either way, you can see that essentially at the end of the day, it's going to give us the same information that ROI did. It's going to be the same thing. No, no differences, no, no, uh, no solution differences. It's just a very different setup than what we have seen before. It's what's called an algebraic setup for these problems. Again, nothing to, nothing to, to concern yourselves with uh, too much at this point. <clears throat> One thing I, I, do, I do want to touch on this kind of briefly before we flip over to the Monte Carlo stuff, and that's on nonlinear programming. So everything we've been dealing with so far has been very much in the linear space. Nonlinear programming is a completely different matter all the way around. So um, while we, we tend to think of things in a very linear fashion, a lot of the stuff that exists out in the world is actually nonlinear. So here you have some <clears throat> examples of nonlinear functions that exist out there in the world. So if you're really into stock portfolio optimization, it turns into a nonlinear programming. Uh, in the organizational behavior world, there's this stress and productivity link. It's, it's what's called an inverted U. We're at really low levels of stress. You're not always productive. As stress gets a little bit more uh, ramped up, you tend to be operating at optimal productivity. Um, and then as stress gets overwhelming, then you tend not to be as productive. Uh, so we've all maybe have seen some experiences with that to this point, uh, this mod or this semester. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that are nonlinear. So let's take a, a quick peek at how this looks, right? So this is a, a straightforward linear function here. But the minute we start to tweak this and add any kind of nonlinear term to it, we don't have that proportional increase anymore. And when we don't have that proportional increase, finding some kind of optimal solution becomes really, really difficult. So this is what happens here, right? Let me, let me zoom out of this thing. Let's see if we can return here. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, let's zoom. It's somewhere. I'm also working on my Mac, which I really have not all the way understood how to work with yet. Uh, you'll probably, you probably have this on your machine somewhere. I have every reason to believe that you do. There we go. Okay. No, I can do it. I did it. All right. That's success. Awesome. So this would be a non-linear surface, right? Clearly a non-linear surface for sure. Fine. Cool. So the problem becomes if we want to find some kind of optimum here, we need to know where to look. So imagine if you will, you are a person and you are a person who has been blindfolded and I've taken you to this surface and I've told you to find the highest point. So what you're going to do, I'm not going to let you out there with just your feet and your hands. I'm going to give you a stick. You're going to be blindfolded. You're going to have a stick and I'm going to say, find the highest peak that you can. So what you're probably going to do is you're going to take a step and feel with your stick. Is there anywhere around you where your stick goes higher? If yes, you'll move to that point. If no, you'll stay. So depending on where you get put in this space, where you drop off could be very different. If I put you somewhere like here, for instance, let's see if I can, let's see if I can do a decent job here. Okay, great. If I put you somewhere like here, you're going to keep going up. You're going to go up, you're going to go up, you're going to go up. And then finally, you'll reach this point here. And when you reach that point, you're going to feel around with your stick. And what you'll find is that there are no points around you that are higher, right? Clearly, that's, that is the highest point. So what you've done there is you have found the local optima, or in this case, the local maxima. 
right? Does that mean that it is the absolute maxima, that it's the global maxima? No, of course not. We can see very clearly that it is not the maxima or the global maxima. Global maxima would be somewhere around here. So depending on where you actually start in this space is going to very much dictate what solution you actually come to. So that's the problem with these nonlinear programming problems. It all depends on where we start. Where, where, does this, where does whatever algorithm we're using start trying to find this solution? And depending on where we start, we could find very different outcomes. That's why, so when we get into these nonlinear programming problems, we would end up having a lot of different iterations, trying a lot of different starting points to see if we can come to some kind of consistent, um, a consistent endpoint. If we come to a consistent endpoint, then we can be pretty confident that we have found some kind of global maxima or optima, whatever it may be. If we keep getting inconsistent results and we're not settling anywhere, that means we're probably really not going to find the true optimal solution that we're just going to have to settle for the best that we can possibly do. So that's where these problems get kind of really pretty interesting and pretty tricky. Um, and they're kind of cool problems to, to work through. So we don't need to worry about really getting into these in R. Uh, we can do it, but they, they turn into a ton of programming. One thing that kind of makes them a little bit tricky is that in any kind of nonlinear programming problem or nonlinear regression uh, problems is you have to know the, the shape of your nonlinearity before you even start. So if you don't know the shape of your nonlinearity, then it's going to be tough to solve the problem. Um, so that's why we won't worry too much about it. But here's a quick, uh, quick demonstration of what we have going on. And essentially, I just want to skip down to this very last part here. So depending on what we are trying to do, we could get very different solutions from where we start. So if I wanted to find something in the y-axis that, that had a value of 80, for instance, right? Here are our two 80s on the y-axis. Depending on where we start on the x-axis is going to dictate what our x value is gonna be. It could be anywhere from 10, it could be 10, or it could be something like right, negative six. And it all depends on where we would essentially put this dot to find where that y is going to be. So if we started somewhere like here, Obviously, we're going to end up with a solution of y equals to 80 and x equals about negative 6. If we start our orange dot here, we're going to end up with a y of 80 and an x of 10. So that's why <clears throat> the, for these problems, the starting point is important. Where you start is going to dictate where you end up and what your ultimate solutions are going to be. Does that mean that either one of these two solutions would be wrong? Eh, not necessarily wrong, but they could lead to very different interpretations of what has happened and what kind of actions you would take depending on what you see here and what you get out of your programming problems. So I know that's a lot to throw out there. Um, and you, if you don't have any questions now, that's fine. If something occurs to you, that's cool, but I'll go ahead and open it up. Did, did, it, did anybody have any questions or any thoughts that occurred to you about any of that stuff? If not, that's, that's completely okay. Okay, awesome. So I do wanna run through Monte Carlo stuff really quickly. Um, the one reason to kind of run through it quickly is that <clears throat> we didn't think of it like this, but we've already pretty much seen a very specific case of Monte Carlo simulation. The whole entire time we were doing process simulation, uh, we were just doing Monte Carlo stuff. It is a very specific kind of Monte Carlo simulation. Um, it is a, a, a discrete event simulation. Uh, but again, all we're doing is simulating a number of outcomes into some kind of distribution to see what the average would be or to see what the possible uh, potential outcomes would be. So again, we've already, we've already seen it. Um, but here I'm going to kind of give you an idea of, of some various ways that we could implement some of it. So some kind of fun problems that we have going on here. So if you are at all interested in hockey, you may know about uh, this notion that um, if a team is behind in points or, or goals, uh, they'll pull the goalie to try to get an extra offensive player on the ice to try to even up the game <clears throat> with some kind of uh, time remaining. 
You don't want to pull the goalie too early because that's taking one of your primary defenders off the ice and leaving your net empty. But you don't want to do it too late either, right? You don't want to do it with 15 seconds left because that really doesn't give you a good chance to be able to um, to tie up the game. So to find some kind of good solution that's going to uh, increase your probability of winning, that's kind of the name of the game here. <clears throat> so what I've done is set up this kind of blank um, uh, uh, blank data frame. And we're going to go and we're going to work through and we're going to do some, some filling in of this data frame at like 10 second intervals. So we, we have some historical information um, for any given possession about the, the probability of a full strength goal. Right? So the probability of a full strength goal for any given possession is 0 .0083. All right? So that's some information that we have. And we know that if we pull our goalie, that the probability of scoring goes up to 0 .0133, all right? We also know that if we pull our goalie, the probability of the other team scoring goes up to 0 .02. So clearly, as, the, um, as, as we pull that primary net defender out, the probability that the other team is going to score goes up quite a bit. So we have some information here kind of laid out for us. And what we are gonna do now is we have to kind of create a function that loops through this time frame and updates itself from the information that is in the previous row. So let's take a look and see kind of how this works. So we're gonna define a function here. And we are going to define uh, the current score, right? Time date, time data dollar sign current score one, so that's the first row is going to be equal to score. Remember, score is what we have up here, so score is, is negative one. Negative one would mean we are down one goal, all right? So what we have from here is our time behind. Again, this is all just about the first row. And what we're doing here is just a series of if-else statements. So if-else, if, if our time data current score is less than one, give this a one. If that's not the case, give it a zero. So this is indicating whether we are behind in this current time frame or not. That's all we're doing there. Are we behind or not? Now we're going to look at whether or not we're going to pull the goalie or not. So here we have to have this logical and. Is it the pull time? Right, which we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see what the pull time means in a little while. So is pull time equal to the time left? And are we behind, yes or no? So if we are going to pull our goal, if all of these, if these two conditions are true, we will pull the goalie. If they're not true, we won't pull the goalie, right? So one means the goalie has been pulled, zero means we haven't, right? Now we get in some, uh, into some other work here. Uh, this is the probability that we score or not. So if our goalie is pulled is equal to zero, we have some kind of probability of scoring a goal, okay? And that's whether we have scored a full strength, the probability of a full strength goal, or the probability of pulling our own goalie. So if we have pulled the goalie, we're going to have some kind of probability of scoring based upon pulling our goalie, right? So I think the probability of that was something like, right, right, 0 0.0133. All right, so here's this, the next part that comes into this, the probability that they scored, right? So here's this probability of if our goalie is indeed pulled, we have a probability of, of essentially them scoring on, on their own goal, right? So, <clears throat> that's just for the first row of data at this point. Now we need to do that. We need to create this for loop that will do this for every remaining row. And here we're just using this I minus one indexing because if we're looking at the current score right now, we want to see what the current score is before, was before, and whether or not the, the first team score, whether or not we scored or they scored. Right, so we want to uh, subtract these out from the previous rows to update them in the current row that we're in. So whatever information happened at row one needs to update the information that's at row two. 
and whatever happens at row two then needs to update the information that goes into the row three, into row four, so forth and so on. Does that kind of make some sense? We're just updating row by row using the information that came before, All right? So here we get into uh, all of these probabilities and then finally the result, right? So the result that we're looking for, a favorable result for us would be if we tie the game or win, right? Winning is great or tying, we just don't want to lose. So that's essentially what we're gonna look for. So here in our function, we're going to specify our pull time at 120. So that would be a minute and 20 or 120 seconds, that's two minutes. So of, after one run, here's what we have. We have a zero, which means that we lost, right? It's a game that we lost, that's fine. But the whole goal of Monte Carlo simulation isn't to do anything one time. It's to do it multiple times to get an idea of what could happen. What are your potentials for these things happening? So if we run this with a minute and 20 seconds, we would see that on a kind of our, our average win rate is point, or win or tie rate is 0.118. So of those thousand simulations, we win about 12 percent of those thousand simulations if we pull the goalie uh, at 120 seconds. If we dip that down to 60 seconds, uh, it is a reduction in our win rate. It's not a massive reduction, but it's still a reduction. So the, the point that kind of would drive this is that we do see a reduction in the win rate with pulling at 60 seconds. So it would make you kind of start to question what the ideal strategy is. Should you pull at 120 for a slightly improved win rate or pull at 60 for a, 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 a lesser win rate? So the, the great thing that comes with this is that we can just implement this through code. We don't actually have to run the risk of doing this in a season, right? Imagine two seasons worth of a hockey coach intentionally getting behind a goal and trying to knot something up with 120 seconds, a random draw of 120 or 60 seconds. Right, that coach is probably not going to stick around for another season to see how well the strategy actually got implemented. No, but instead what we can do is we can just try this and we can just do this and, and see, what it, see what it would actually happen. Now we could make this a ton more complicated, right? I mean, obviously we could build so much more information into this because these are, the, again, these are kind of global population probabilities of scoring. Right? There are teams that are not as good as other teams. And I know that if I'm down by a goal against a team that they, they're, just, they're not very good, they're just getting lucky, right? that may change my calculus a little bit. But again, just as a very baseline uh, notion of what the, what the potentials are, these Monte Carlo simulations give us a really good idea of what can happen here in this particular regard at kind of a big population average. So they are helpful for getting an idea of, of what the potentials are. Um, right, so here, here's another example based upon ticketing. Um, that's, uh, that's all great. Here's uh, some A-B testing. Here's kind of a, a different, uh, a kind of a straightforward example here of stock price closing. So the stock market is in no way, shape or form a linear kind of process. And if you are trying to predict what kind of a final day may be, right, here's a good way that we could kind of figure out what those changes may be to get an idea of the distribution of outcomes. So essentially here, what we're looking at is primarily a distribution of outcomes. If we would run this, how many times, how many times did we run this? Uh, what is this? 100,000 simulations. So if you're looking for 100,000 simulations of what this closing day could be. It's anywhere between essentially 18 and 31 with the bulk of the distribution resting somewhere around 25. So you can use things like these Monte Carlo simulations to get an idea of what could happen. Anytime you just look at one simulation, again, going back to process simulation, you could get something at the outer edges of your distribution. Right? We could get any of, these, any of these values within here. It's of course possible. Does that mean that it's gonna happen every single time? No, of course. So if we go into this and we would run some, a simulation one time and we get something close to a 30, we're gonna say, wow, that's, 
that's great. I'm definitely going to do that thing, whatever it may be. But the reality is that's kind of an, uh, an aberrant uh, outcome. It doesn't happen very often. Really, the more probable outcome sits somewhere in this distribution. So again, this Monte Carlo stuff is just gonna give us some kind of distribution of outcomes to help us inform how much risk we actually wanna take on in some kind of setting. There could be a situation where uh, the distribution of the outcomes certainly does not look like it's gonna be favorable for us to take on the risk. So we wouldn't wanna do it. Again, this is going to save us a lot of pain of actually implementing something and then have it have it blow up in our face. So anytime we're doing any kind of these, any modeling like this, uh, right, uh, like some of the, undoubtedly some of the modeling that people are doing now, uh, healthcare wise, I mean, they're doing stuff like this and looking at distributions of outcomes because there's no one way to say that I'm right about this individual thing and I'm going to run it one time. Instead, I'll run it uh, a million times and see what all the potentials are. And that's, that's, that's what Monte Carlo is going to do for us. It allows for kind of risk assessment in a safe way, just like process simulation did. So again, I know it's kind of a quick, a quick rundown, but that's the, that's the general idea behind this Monte Carlo stuff. It's just to, just to kind of uh, get that distribution of outcomes for some kind of uh, usually risk assessment, but it could be for anything. If you want to know what the potentials are, it's the way to do it. So did anybody have any thoughts about that or questions or ideas? Um, a question on the last example uh, with like the hockey pull time. Um, I presume that there's some kind of way to, like if you just make the code a little bit more complicated to kind of iterate through the different pull times automatically. Oh, for sure, for sure. So if we look at this thing right here, this result, this kind of results guy, so if you just wrap this and then, and then in another function, and let's say let's say the function is going to take y and put y right here, that's it. Okay, gotcha. That's all. That that's in this particular scenario, that is all you would have to do. Um, yeah. So that's turning this into a, a much bigger function to in, incorporate more stuff. You could absolutely do it. So here, like score, for instance, right? We're supposing that we're down by two goals. Or, or right, we've, we've went through this with one goal. But what if we're down to two and we wanna see if maybe we can pull at 180 seconds? All right, again, that's, that's something that we could incorporate into this and just keep, just keep this code rolling along. Yep. Cool. So one, one thing that I, that, I wanna, that I skipped over here, but I wanna kind of make clear about this, is that there is a lot of software that exists for doing Monte Carlo simulation. Um, uh, so there's a thing called Palisades and there's a its particular thing is called at risk, the at sign risk and a single, right? Uh, here's the single license here, right? That's $2,000 per year to use their decision tool suite or, or to use at risk. If you want the whole decision tool suite, it's $3,000 a year. So you would pay that much money for something that you could code for free in R or Python or whatever it is you wanted to do. But um, so just, just kind of keep that in mind is, you know, depending on where you ultimately end up career wise, trajectory wise, uh, the likelihood that you may want to do some Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, so I, I, um, I know a guy who's a county engineer and he uses Monte Carlo simulation uh, for like buying salt for the winter. Right, so looking at how much salt he ultimately would want to purchase given the potential outcomes. So he uses some Excel add in that costs some money, right? It's not anything like Pal what Palisade has, um, but you know, it's not, it's not free. So just kind of keep that in mind that uh, that's, it may, may seem complicated, uh, especially uh, if depending on how new you are to coding or how much experience you have, but you can pretty quickly start messing around with, with these things and, and get to them without much hassle. And they turn into some, some fun programming challenges too. Anything else? All right, so I hope that you all had the opportunity to see some of the emails about the final. Uh, the final should be pretty straightforward. I 
tend to have my the final be easier than the midterm. So if you found the midterm to be difficult at all, there should be some some relief when we get into the uh, into the final. Um, it's not it won't be as programming intensive at all. It'll be kind of a few things to fill in, but mostly um, mostly all there. It's going to be a lot more conceptual uh, than not. So. Um, there's you will have the rest of your professional careers to practice the technical side of it but making sure that you that you're cool on the conceptual side is is every bit as important as actually knowing how to do it right knowing how to do its practice as long as you understand the concept that's kind of an important thing so um that's that's kind of where the final will will go um like i said you'll have a few days to do it it should be pretty straightforward you can always email me if questions come up or anything like that um yeah i will treat it just the way we would if we were doing it in class i'm not going to tell anybody no i'm not going to help you this is a test figure it out on your own i'd rather give you some information to help nudge you forward into the right direction so you feel better about what you've done cool is it like oh sorry is yeah. it just the midterm with like the markdown file um it's probably going to be even easier than that i'll probably um Give, there, there will be a markdown file for you to to run your code, um, but after the code is is run, I'm just gonna have I'm just gonna have a form for you to put answers into. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that, that way you don't have to worry about the knitting and all of that stuff. Um, it'll be a little it'll be a little bit easier, more straightforward. Um, again, I'll give you, and it probably actually won't be a markdown file. It'll probably just be an R file that I'll give you. That way, you, again, no hassles with stuff. Um, just get the answer, fill it in. And then, and then again, there's going to be a, a big chunk of conceptual stuff in there as opposed to technical stuff, technical stuff. Uh, like I said, let's just practice. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Of course. Anything else? No, if, if anything occurs to you, uh, always feel free to let me know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, otherwise, Good luck with all of your finals. I hope they all go swimmingly um, and they're great. Um, and just as a final word, I'm really sorry that we couldn't be in class together. This has been the biggest bummer of my professional life. And I've, this has just not been fun. Um, and I'm, I know it's not fun for you all either. So I appreciate that we're all kind of, it's, I'm glad we're all in it together, but I really wish we didn't have to be. Um, so I don't know what the composition of you is between junior and senior, but as we get back, if, when, we, when we get back on campus, if you ever need anything, if you ever want to stop by, if you ever have our questions, uh, whether it be from, um, even if it's not my class, um, I'm always uh, willing to help out with our related questions or programming related questions kind of in general. Uh, if you talk to other students from the past, um, it's my biggest weakness and people exploit it to no end. They'll say, oh gosh, it's an R problem. And all I have to do is say, Seth, here's an R problem. And it's like, it's a compulsion that I will probably help you out with. Um, so even students who I've, who are not students anymore um, will still email me with it. It's like, hey, I've got a job interview and they're giving me this technical interview. You got any thoughts on this? Yeah, I've got thoughts on it. So, um, you know, please don't, don't ever hesitate to, to ask me because um, there's few things I love more uh, professionally than, than, than teaching, but programming is it may be one of them. It's tied or it's right up there. So if I can ever help you, all you have to do is let me know. Cool. Right on. Well, see you all later. And if there's anything you need, let me know. Thank you, Seth. Yep, absolutely. Yes,